and gentlemen, welcome to the CILE Academy and this week's guest lecture by Professor Walter Kalin on legal aspects of human mobility in the context of disasters and climate change. Allow me to hand you over now to our session moderator, co-director of the E Academy, Professor Patricia galvao -Tiles. Thank you very much, Zue, and greetings to all. It's a pleasure to welcome you today, Walter. Uh, professor Walter Kalin um, is a professor emeritus of uh, international and constitutional law at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Uh, he has uh, served as um, a representative of the United Nations Secretary General uh, on uh, human rights of internally displaced persons and also as a member of the UN Human Rights Committee and as Special Rapporteur of the Human Rights Commission on the Situation of Human Rights um, in Iraqi Occupied Kuwait. He's presently envoy of the chair of the Platform on Disaster Displacement and a former envoy uh, of the chairmanship of the Nansen Initiative uh, on Disaster-Induced Cross-Border Displacement. Currently, he also serves as member of the expert advisory group to the high-level panel on internal displacement, as well as member of the ILA Committee on International Law and Sea Level Rise. And in the context of this uh, ILA Committee, uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, Professor Walter Kalin, um, big admirer of, uh, of your work. Uh, we are very grateful that you have accepted um, our invitation to be present today in the academy in the week where we have the module on international disaster law and you'll be speaking on legal aspects of uh, human mobility in the context of disasters and climate change which is a very important topic and again we are very grateful for your presence um, i'm sure that the students uh, the participants will appreciate greatly uh, your all your knowledge and commitment to this topic and after your initial presentation, we will have a Q&A session. So the floor is yours, uh, Professor Walter Klelin. And once again, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Patricia. I don't know whether participants see me, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, let me uh, start. Um, welcome to everyone. Uh, good afternoon. What I'm going to do is uh, to talk about a specific aspect of uh, uh, international disaster law, namely all the problems, the challenges linked to people moving in the context of disastrous adverse effects of climate change. This is what the media very often call climate refugees. I will not use that term and I will tell you why a little bit later. You already have heard yesterday that international disaster law is a difficult area of international law when it comes to its sources. We don't have the big convention. Sources are very scattered. Many of the sources are soft law, guidelines, things like that. And what I try to do first is to provide you an overview on how to conceptualize human mobility in the context of disasters and adverse effects of climate change. And uh, then we look at some of the legal uh, aspects. I've uh, already shared with you the uh, final report of the International Law Association a committee on International Law and Sea Level Rise, the, uh, the um, <coughs> Sydney Declaration. I shared it because I think that's quite a useful document which tries to synthesize what we have. You will find a lot on the hard law behind these principles in the text, in the footnotes. So if you're really interested in the topic, uh, go back to that uh, document. Eileen, uh, maybe we uh, have the um, slides so we can uh, start. <clears throat> As I said, um, we will, uh, next please, we will uh, start uh, to um, 
look at the conceptualization. Next, please. This is uh, something uh, that uh, very much comes out of work we have done with uh, the Nansen Initiative, the Platform on Disaster Displacement. Uh, Patricia mentioned that, uh, them. These are and have been the Nansen Initiative in the past, now the Platform on Disaster Displacement. Uh, that's a state-led process to look at how to better pre uh, protect people displaced in the context of disasters, adverse effects of climate change, and how to prevent such a displacement. It's a, a group of states uh, driving that process uh, from your region. Uh, we have the Philippines, uh, Bangladesh from Asia, and Fiji and Australia from, from the Pacific. You already are familiar with uh, the uh, notion of disaster, the um, definition of disaster. This here is uh, this eruption of um, how a society can function um, in the case where a hazard, exposure, vulnerability uh, interact. Next one. Next slide. I'm um, referring to the disaster definition because it also helps us to better understand when people have to flee in the context uh, of um, disasters and uh, climate change. We're talking about disaster displacement when people are forced or ordered to leave their homes or places of habitual residence, either because the disaster already is happening or in anticipation of it to avoid the risk. And if you're taking the disaster risk model, which you already know, then the interaction of a hazard, here a veteran climate event, uh, the exposure and the vulnerability, and we can uh, say that people really have to flee or have to leave their homes when they are exposed to a hazard and when they are too vulnerable to withstand the impacts of that hazard. We are using a very wide notion of disaster displacement, covering flight where people really run and end up as internally displaced persons or flee across borders. But evacuation is also a form of human mobility that uh, is um, forced in the sense that people don't have an alternative or very little alternative. And where whole villages such as in Fiji or in Vietnam have to be relocated as a consequence of sea level rise, flooding, etc., then again, uh, this is displacement. Scenarios, disaster scenarios, disaster displacement can take place in the context of sudden onset disasters, a tropical storm, but also an earthquake and a volcano eruption, but also on uh, slow onset events, processes such as sea level rise in Africa, very much um, desertification and drought. Sometimes natural hazards and man made hazards interact. Remember Fukushima. And then sometimes disasters and associated displacement and flight also incur, uh, uh, occur in situations where we already have a, a conflict uh, situation. What is important is, and that's why we are not using the notion of climate refugee, that's one of the reasons, I will come to another one later. Climate refugee kind of suggests that people flee because of climate and climate change and global warming, that there is a direct link and causality between a process that is linked to global warming and the flight. But if you're looking at the disaster risk model, then we see it's not just the hazard. It's also where people live, the exposure, and that's very often a human factor. If you're thinking about irregular settlements in flat plains on very steep hills in many of the cities all over the world, and then vulnerability, that's entirely human. That's uh, marginalization, poverty, sometimes lack of good governance. So it's always multi-causal human mobility in the context of disasters and uh, adverse effects of climate change. Next slide, please. Uh, very quickly, um, to explain, to, to show that this is a real issue for your region. 
2019, we had um, <clears throat> Uh, more than um, 19 million people displaced in the context of sudden onset disasters. Uh, there are no uh, figures available for population movements uh, covering the whole region regarding slow onset uh, processes. Uh, last year, most of these uh, events were weather related. And uh, when we're looking at the form, very often evacuations, and then sometimes people being able to go back quite soon after a few weeks, after a few months, but also situations where people could not go back because of huge distractions, because um, places where they had been living have become uh, uh, no longer suitable for human habitation. And the future is not bright. As we know, climate change, the uh, World Bank has done a very good report and has come with scenarios. You see the figures here. But what is interesting, the World Bank tells us, if you're not doing anything, then we have very large numbers. If you really adapt our development models to respond to these challenges, to include communities at particular risk of displacement, numbers will be very uh, much lower. And we, if we really implement the Paris Agreement, it's even lower than that. Next slide. What this indicates is um, that we can do quite a lot of things. But displacement is not only and displacement always in the sense of forced movement. It's not the only um, way people move in the context of disasters and the effects of climate change. Sometimes people decide to leave their homes, their places of habitual uh, uh, residence, because they still have quite a lot of space for making their decisions. They can say, OK, it's not good here, but let's stay. Or they can say, no, it's better to move. And this we call migration in the sense of voluntary migration. Here we have internal migration. That's, again, the very large number. And we have also some cases of cross-border migration. And this migration across borders, of course, can be irregular or irregular. And I come back to that. And then again, migration as a way to cope with uh, the impacts of um, disasters and effects of climate change or to anticipate them can take uh, different forms. It can be temporary uh, migration. We see that uh, that sometimes uh, during or after a fl uh, flooding, a part of the family moves to big cities to make some money, send back uh, some money for the family back home to help to repair, to rebuild. It can be seasonal every year during summer. And I'll have uh, later an example from the Pacific region where such seasonal migration um, is based on actual policies and agreements. It can be circular. You go, you come back, you go, you come back. Or it can be permanent. Next slide. So that's the kind of challenges. And that's how we can look at it, how we can understand what's happening. Let me uh, now focus on what can be done and what the law can uh, contribute to policy uh, responses. Next slide. If people move because they are exposed to a hazard and are too vulnerable to withstand the impact of that uh, hazard, then we can try to prevent displacement, to reduce displacement risks, simply by trying to reduce the hazard, by trying to reduce exposure, and by trying to reduce vulnerability. In the context of climate change, uh, reducing the hazard is um, climate change mitigation, reduction of the emission of greenhouse gases, full implementation of the Paris Agreement. And that's, of course, uh, a task of all uh, countries, but in particular, the responsibility of the big emitters.
we can try to reduce exposure when we help people to migrate, to move out of places at risk of being hit by disaster, or helping people to move out of harm's way even before the disaster strikes through migration or plant relocation. And it can help to reduce the vulnerability and increase the capacity, the resilience. These are measures of climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction. You certainly already heard about the Sendai uh, uh, framework and in general building resilience development in the sense of the uh, sustainable development goals. But still we will have situations where people are displaced internally or across borders. And in the Asia region, it's mainly it's 95, 99% within one countries. In other regions, it's different. You have quite a lot of cross-border displacement, for instance, in Central America. But in Asia, it's mainly internal displacement. But sometimes, particularly in the Pacific, also people moving across borders. Next slide. So we really can talk about different policy tools or a toolbox. And this is what um, the Platform on Disaster Displacement and Anson Initiative, and now also many of the interna other international uh, efforts um, through the UN are promoting. Helping people to stay, helping people to move out of harm's way, helping people displaced internally or across borders. So stay, move, protect. And again, with these uh, measures you have here uh, on uh, this uh, slide from disaster risk reduction, resilience building, climate change adaptation, to opening up regular migration pathways, implement plant relocation, or then really protection of the displaced. Next. So if these are the policy options we have, what is the law underlying these policies? And what kind of guidance does the law uh, give us? Next slide. First, I think it's very important to start and to take as point of departure the uh, principle of the primary res responsibility of states, the primary responsibility of governments to protect their own people. I mean, that's um, the concept of sovereignty as enshrined in uh, the UN Charter, but sovereignty understood as the responsibility of uh, governments to take care of their own population. So in the um, International Law As uh, Association Sydney Declaration, we um, put that uh, into uh, the words you have on these slides. Uh, states have a responsibility to use uh, the uh, best um, uh, practices. Sorry. Uh, have uh, the responsibility uh, to use uh, the best practical means at their disposal in accordance with uh, their capabilities, but also in accordance with their obligations. We mentioned here the international human rights obligations or the relevant international standards and frameworks. For instance, the Sendai framework, to take appropriate effective measures to reduce disaster risks, to adapt uh, to the adverse effects of climate change in order to protect the lives and ensure the safety of persons under their jurisdiction. The Sindai Declaration is on sea level rise, so where you have the three points, it's always sea level rise. But uh, of course, you can generalize that, and uh, if uh, the task of the committee would have been a bit wider, then it would exactly read like that without reference to sea level rise, reference to all kinds of um, disasters. Second, to prevent their displacement, and third, to protect and assist them in the event of displacement. And again, coming back to the, um, uh, to the toolbox, you see here, all the tools of that toolbox need uh, to be um, used and implemented. Next slide. And as I said at the beginning, we have scattered legal sources, but we do have the UN Charter 
and um, their uh, their um, provisions on state sovereignty, but also on international cooperation. And if I said the primary responsibility is with governments, then the international community also has also a secondary responsibility. International human rights law is important because we're talking about people, people who are exposed to dangers, dangers to their life, dangers to their health, etc. cetera. Um, so these uh, notions here, these rights are important. And not only international human rights law, but also their equivalence in national constitutions, because most of the countries have exactly these rights uh, that they are enshrined in international law nowadays, also in the constitutions. International environment law is important as a source. The Paris Agreement, I already mentioned it, on uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But then also um, international environmental law conventions, the conventions on biodiversity, the certification, etc. This is about safeguarding ecosystems, protecting ecosystems, because we know that one factor for, uh, that leads to displacement um, is linked to deterioration of ecosystems. And then, of course, the international disaster law, uh, the Sendai framework, but also the um, ILC uh, principles you know, we'll hear about uh, tomorrow, if I understand correctly. And then also migration law. Here again, at the level of um, soft law, we have the Global Compact on Migration, but then we have binding agreements on free movement of persons, usually regional agreements or sub-regional agreements, sometimes also bilateral agreements, and other parts of international migration law. Next slide. Okay, if you're looking now at the different uh, policy options, helping people to stay. I uh, already uh, mentioned that uh, here disaster risk reduction is uh, very much at the forefront besides uh, climate change adaptation and environmental protection. And because this is about uh, disaster law, uh, let me just say very few words about uh, the Sendai Agreement. If you compare uh, the, uh, Sen uh, the Sendai framework, if you compare the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction with the Kyogo framework. There are many differences, but one of the most notable differences is the approach to human mobility. The Kyogo framework very much put the emphasis on if we reduce disaster risks, then people can stay. Technical approaches, stronger roofs, thicker walls, dams, etc. What we have learned is that Disaster risk reduction also has to look at displacement risks and sometimes even to address displacement. And without going into details, you'll find all the details in the footnotes to the um, ILA report I shared with you. You uh, will uh, see that the framework, uh, the Sendai framework, talks about, for instance, cooperation between neighboring countries to prepare for disaster displacement or identifying locations where um, displacement can take place. The um, UNDRR has um, published a words into action guide on disaster displacement, how to reduce address impacts and strengthen resilience. And the idea is, and the um, guidelines are very, very uh, hands-on operational, it's really to integrate human mobility aspects into disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation plans and strategies. Maybe um, a few of the participants uh, 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 here today uh, are involved in these kind of works. Um, uh, particularly uh, this year, uh, countries should uh, finalize uh, their um, revision of disaster risk reduction strategies and their integrate disaster uh, displacement risk uh, issues. Next slide. Helping people to move out of harm's way. This is about evacuations. Evacuations uh, take place when people are facing a serious and uh, imminent risk. Sometimes people want to evacuate. 
in that in this case, uh, governments have a human rights duty to facilitate uh, such voluntary evacuation if uh, people otherwise would be unable to evacuate and as a consequent might die. This is the duty to protect life. Sometimes people do not want to evacuate. So uh, authorities are ordering evacuations or are even implementing them with force. This is possible in voluntary ev evacuations. However, again, legal requirements. You need a legal basis. Uh, the uh, purpose really has to, to be protect life and health, not some hidden agendas. And the uh, ordering of the uh, evacuation is necessary uh, to, to protect life and health. And less intrusive measures uh, are, would be insufficient. Uh, this is um, directly deduced from the right uh, to uh, liberty of movement and uh, freedom to uh, choose one's place of residence as enshrined in the, international, in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 12. Paragraph three talks about limitations and these are the requirements legal basis, uh, legitimate purpose, and proportionality. And of course, evacuations always have to be carried out uh, with full respect for the life, dignity, liberty, security of the evacuees. Next slide. Helping people to move out of harm's way through planned relocation, shifting whole communities, whole villages away from danger zones, um, what is required here, because again, international human rights law and most constitutions guarantee the right to um, uh, choose one's place of residence. And this also means the right not to have to shift one's place of residence, a right that is not absolute, it can be limited. But um, the um, underlying uh, uh, principle re release or, or rather the underlying obligation is to receive the full free and informed consent of affected people. That's also important from a uh, practical experience. Planned relocations are very expensive and we have seen many cases where without agreement of affected people such uh, relocations fail and it's a loss of money, it's uh, ineffective. But sometimes one cannot uh, obtain the consent of people. Here, planned relocations are allowed, but only as a measure of last resort, only if it's really necessary to safeguard the lives and safety of those affected. And again, this has to be provided for by law. And again, implementation has to respect all uh, the rights, uh, not only of those who are relocated, but also of those who receive the relocated people. Because if you um, shift a whole community from one place to another, usually on that other location, there are already communities living there and they also have their rights. It can be very demanding in the con uh, specific context and a whole lecture simply could be about uh, these uh, issues, but we don't have time for that. Next slide. So migration, uh, migration is um, about internal migration, which usually uh, doesn't uh, create many problems because in most countries, people are free to move within their own country. There might be some administrative requirements uh, to register at the new place uh, of residence, things like that. But usually there are not big uh, uh, problems. And if you're, uh, again, if you're looking at your region, but also other regions of the world, in countries particularly affected by disasters and effects of climate change, we see that the traditional rural urban migration more and more is also motivated and, um, and triggered by environmental uh, impacts and environmental reasons but uh, it's then not a different category of people. It's just the reason why they uh, move from rural to, to urban areas. And again, this can create uh, 
a big challenges in terms of urban planning, etc. Maybe we can take that up in the discussion. Many comes to uh, moving voluntarily across borders. You all know there is no right to be admitted in a different other country unless you are a refugee in the sense of um, international law. But here we're talking about voluntary migration. So these are not people who are displaced. And um, here we don't have um, any kind of law providing, as I said, people who want to, to move across borders, migrate out of the country with uh, any rights. What the Sydney Declaration and also the Global Compact on Migration say is that the best way is to avoid that such migration is irregular. It's much, much better to ensure that um, such migration is uh, regular, is um, safe, uh, is um, based, uh, yeah, as we say in this uh, Sydney Declaration, on um, migration ag agreements. So the Sydney Declaration um, recommends, and this is a recommendation, not, not an obligation, that states of origin and destination should review existing domestic law as well as bilateral regional agreements, regional migration agreements, and consider new laws and agreements to facilitate migration as an adaptation measure, as a measure to cope with environmental impacts and disaster impacts. And the uh, states of origin and destination should cooperate to ensure that the full range of rights and protection afforded to the migrants uh, is respected. Next slide. How can this look like? I already alluded to um, seasonal worker programs. New Zealand and Australia have seasonal worker programs uh, for and also uh, permit quotas for people uh, from uh, affected uh, small island states in the South Pacific. And these uh, programs uh, do not only serve the um, economic interests of New Zealand and Australia, but they are framed in a way, unlike many of other seasonal worker programs, they are framed in a way to uh, help these uh, workers to then invest the money they make into building the resilience of their own families and, and communities. We um, have, um, and this is the previous Kiribati uh, climate change adaptation strategy, efforts to prepare populations who will have to move sooner or later due to effects of uh, climate change to be able to uh, to, to uh, manage um, their life in new situations, to avoid being marginalized as unqualified workers. And these are training and education uh, uh, programs that have been implemented. Very interestingly, free movement agreements. They are always um, concluded for reasons of uh, economic interests, but we have seen that they are used in disaster situations. Uh, Nepal, India have open borders. And after the Kathmandu Valley earthquake, many people affected by the earthquake simply were able to move to India to find work somewhere. They did not need humanitarian assistance. Uh, New Zealand, Australia have a bilateral agreement on free movement of persons. After the big earthquake in Christchurch 10 years ago, we saw a spike of immigration from Christchurch to Australia. Because unless you were a construction worker, uh, insurance lawyer, or something like that, economic opportunities declined after the earthquake. So people decided, oh, let's go to Australia and when things are better, then we are coming back. Um, so, uh, and, and other, uh, IGAD, that's a sub-regional organization in Africa, they are just now adopting a new free movement of persons um, agreement. And for the first time ever, this uh, agreement will have a specific clause on people who move in the context of disaster, particularly drought in um, the Horn of Africa, Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, etc. Next slide. And then we have people who are internally displaced. Here we do not have a convention, except in Africa, 
but you have the guiding principles on internal displacement, a UN document that uh, has been recognized by all states, including all uh, the Asian, uh, the states from the Asia and Asia Pacific region, as an international fr uh, framework for the protection of internally displaced persons. And the Sydney Declaration uh, just says, please use this, uh, these guiding principles and um, also in situations of disasters. Uh, it's providing a, a framework guidelines that are based on international um, human rights law. Next. When it comes to people uh, fleeing across borders, things get again more complicated. First, in most cases, these people do not qualify as refugees. Because in international law, people are defined as people who uh, are fleeing because they face persecution or violence by their own governments or by non-state armed groups in their own country. Of course, um, it is um, not um, the case, uh, sorry, of course, in disaster context, the government doesn't turn against its own population, quite to the contrary. All governments want to help their own people. So they do not qualify as refugees. Having said that, it is still possible that in disaster situations, people are still fleeing persecution or violence. Particularly there, uh, if um, where we have um, where we have an interaction of conflict and disasters. Uh, just to answer a question that came in on internal uh, displacement, the question was, what kind of a convention on internal displacement do we have in Africa? This is so-called African Convention on the um, Assistance and Protection of Internally Displaced uh, Persons in Africa. Long title. It is known as the Kampala Convention. Kampala is the um, capital of Uganda. It was adopted there. So if you are looking on Google uh, for the Kampala Convention, you will immediately find it. And you will see that the Kampala Convention not only covers people displaced uh, by conflict, but also displaced um, in the context of disasters. And it uh, specifically also mentions climate change. Back to people fleeing across borders. So only in very exceptional cases, um, refugee law protects these people. Um, again, uh, following up on Africa, Africa again is an exception because uh, we have a refugee convention in Africa, the African Union Refugee Convention, which has a wider notion of refugees a refugee is also someone fleeing a situation where public order simply collapsed. And in the situation, the case of the Somali famine 2011-2012, Ethiopia and uh, Kenya used the African Convention to recognize these people who fled to neighboring countries to escape famine as refugees. But again, that's regional. It doesn't apply to Asia Pacific. But then how can people be admitted? First, we have seen uh, regional uh, treaties on free movements of persons in many parts of the world actually help people to be admitted. Sometimes we have bilateral migration agreements. For instance, the Marshall Islands in the Pacific and the US have an agreement that allows Marshallese to emigrate to uh, the uh, US for whatever reasons. So it also can be used by people who are really moving because of the effects of, clean, uh, of um, sea level rise. And then we see that not in international law, but in domestic law, in some parts of the world, countries uh, use their migration laws. And uh, sometimes they have what we call exceptional migration measures to admit people. In Latin America, um, in uh, Central America, South America, most countries, for instance, provide for humanitarian visa or temporary protection 
in cases where people are displaced across borders. We just had uh, in Guatemala a big uh, tropical storm a few days ago. And right now this is being used. People are moving across borders, have fled across borders and uh, will be admitted by uh, neighboring countries um, provided um, and will be provided with temporary protection. Guatemala also has asked the United States to um, provide temporary protection for these people. All of that is enshrined in domestic law, not in international law. Next slide. And all of these ideas are very much reflected now in the Global Compact on Migration. This is soft law, but it's inter interesting to see that they say, and this is just a recommendation, that a state should admit migrants compelled to leave their countries of origin due to sudden onset natural disasters um, on the basis of humanitarian visas, private support, uh, sponsorships, etc., while they cannot go back because they cannot adapt back home. But then when we're talking about permanent uh, destruction of, for instance, whole islands, island states in the Pacific in the future, hopefully not, but we'll see, uh, then states should um, provide planned relocation across borders or visa options in cases where due to slow onset disasters, adaptation in or return to their country of origin is not possible. This is interesting because here we really have a meeting of migration law, of disaster law, of international uh, environmental law. Next. And that's my last slide. And what we have is a development also to use international human rights law to protect people from being sent back to their country of origin. The UN Human Rights Committee, the uh, expert body monitoring the implementation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We uh, last year uh, uh, adopted a decision in the case of Te Teota, uh, man from Kiribati versus New Zealand, who was deported back from New Zealand to his island and who he claimed that he uh, would uh, risk his life if sent back due to um, sea level rise. And the um, Human Rights Committee, at the level of principles, accepted that and said that the effects of climate change in the receiving states, in case of a deportation, may expose individuals to a violation of their right to life and the right uh, to be uh, protected against uh, inhuman treatment, meaning uh, intense suffering, thereby triggering the non-refoulement obligation, the obligation the prohibition of uh, forcible return on refoulement is the prohibition of forcible return, thereby triggering the non refoulement obligation of sending states. Um, Tejota lost the case because they told him the situation is difficult, but it's not life threatening at this time. It's not life threatening in the years to come. So we don't know when the Human Rights Committee would think that that is uh, level, this threshold is reached not for the time being, but it's an entry point to use human rights law, the duty to prevent, uh, the duty to protect uh, life, to use uh, that argument to, um, allow, uh, to uh, impose an obligation on states to admit people, not to send them back to the country of origin. Next. The next one is to thank you. And if you're interested uh, to uh, know more about um, the, uh, this uh, work of uh, the uh, platform on disaster displacement here, you also have a link where you find a lot of documents also on issues I mentioned here. And with this, let's go to the uh, discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kellen, for this uh, excellent um, overview of the legal aspects of human mobility related to disasters and uh, and the climate change. It uh, fits very well, at not only with the discussions that we had uh, last week uh, on the module of migration, uh, where we had uh, Professor Van Sanchezai and also Director General Vitorino uh, with us, um, but also uh, with other models that we had uh, both on environmental law and climate change. And so um, I know some of the participants have been following these different models 
and uh, I'm hoping that they will have uh, some questions for you. So the floor is open now. I, I saw that you've already asked one of the questions from Tangi from Namibia, who was on the, I put on the chat and you immediately uh, replied, but now I would offer the floor to our dear participants uh, for um, any questions that you may have to Professor Kalin. I'm trying to see uh, with the help of Ellen. Well, I don't see anybody now, Patricia, but maybe I can just start the debate. Um, Go ahead. Thank you very much, Professor Kaylin. It was really amazing. And it also means a lot to me because I'm working on this topic too, uh, as a part of my PhD uh, thesis. I just had a question on the newly established UN Secretary General's high level panel on internal uh, displacement and um, how it really feeds into the overall framework that you just introduced to us. If you could just briefly talk about that, that would be great. Thank you. I'm uh, very happy uh, to do that. Uh, as I had uh, mentioned um, just in passing, uh, most people uh, displaced in the context of disasters and the uh, adverse effects of climate change remain within their own country. They are internally displaced um, people. So in that sense, um, the um, work of the high level panel on uh, internal, internal displacement has to cover that topic. And uh, in fact, um, even the terms of reference uh, make it clear that the uh, high level panel has to address this issue. Now, it's too early to tell you what the high level panel will recommend. Um, because um, again, in these uh, COVID times, it's a bit difficult uh, for us uh, to work. And uh, this has slowed down the work and we are still uh, in a phase where we are simply looking for input. We have uh, consultations all over the world, bilateral uh, group consultations, uh, studying submissions. So it's only now, actually this afternoon, where we will start, start to look at what will be in the report. Having said that, what is the uh, high level panel likely to look at? First, uh, what we feel or what the panel members feel is, yes, uh, the primary responsibility uh, to protect um, IDPs, internally displaced persons, is with the government because it's their citizens. What is necessary to ensure that governments are willing and able to actually not only protect, but also then find solutions for the internally displaced people. And one of the emphasis is what would be strong incentives and uh, to, to, for governments to really to act. The second element we are looking at is prevention. And prevention of displacement in conflict situations is extremely difficult. Uh, that's my own opinion, but I don't think that the uh, high level panel will come out with really big new um, ideas. But as I was discussing here, when it comes to disaster, we can do quite a lot. And I think there are aspects and we know what to do. So this will not be new. But uh, the interesting thing for the high level panel will be, for instance, to look at funding financing uh, or the existing uh, funding and financing systems really fit for purpose? Uh, is the international community fit for purpose? But then also how could, can we better link, for instance, the work on disaster risk reduction, which is really siloed. How can we better link it to sustainable development goals, to the migration issues, etc.? cetera? Um, we'll see what's come out of it. So these are just some initial thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Um, feel free to raise your hands, make noise. <laughs> uh, Marcus, Marcus from Singapore, you have the floor. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor. Uh, that's a very uh, interesting lecture, which uh, covers a lot of ground and gives us a lot of food for thought. Um, I just had a um, uh, a comment and then maybe a, a question. The, the first thing is, I think uh, lots of lots of people, lots of states would accept that in instances of uh, of uh, disasters happening, uh, it is only natural to be. Uh, willing to accept and to give shelter uh, to those who who require it, even the, if it's something uh, which is a cross border where your neighboring country uh, suffers uh, from it. So that's a very natural uh, um, a sentiment and, and a noble one. Uh, I was just curious in terms of um, the Human Rights Committee's dis decision uh, in relation to the Titiota versus New Zealand case, because there it's it seems to introduce a degree of uncertainty uh, in terms of what the obligations of a uh, non uh, non um are actually, because in general, you would think that it is a return to a place of uh, persecution uh, for certain uh, uh, by the government or by armed groups uh, because of your beliefs or, or other things, but now it has been uh, extended to a situation where it's disaster, not really based on the usual legal requirements. So when, when this kind of expansion of the definition uh, is put in place, um, would it have a uh, give states pause to consider whether they would be more willing to, to accept uh, people from other countries coming in? Uh, because they are no longer certain of the legal regime which governs and who knows which uh, educate, adjudicatory body uh, might, might expand it uh, in a way which wasn't initially contemplated. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's really a very, very interesting question. And um, <clears throat> what you are expressing here uh, has been a part of, of the reaction to that decision, um, particularly from, from government. Uh, at the same time, one has to say that uh, the uh, Human Rights Committee, if you really carefully read the decision, has been careful. Um, they do not say whenever there is a disaster, simply because there is a disaster, people cannot be sent back to the country of origin. What they simply admitted is that besides violence, besides persecution, dangers to one's life also can stem from disasters and effects of climate change. And we have to look at this. This uh, was a, uh, uh, an individual uh, communication from a citizen of um, one of the really vulnerable uh, South Pacific uh, small developing island states, where uh, pessimistic scenarios tell us that these uh, islands one day will no longer be habitable. And I think um, what they wanted to um, kind of signal to the world is you cannot just leave it to the goodwill or bad will of uh, states if people really would have to die unless they uh, are admitted to another country. The problem is that because they had to decide the individual case, and in the individual case, they came to the conclusion the situation is not life-threatening on Kiribati. It's difficult for some people, but not life-threatening. They uh, did not have to develop the criteria when this um, uh, kind of new approach would, would, would apply. And that's a problem. You don't know it. And I don't think that uh, the Human Rights Committee, well, you never know, but I had been a member and I think we always uh, have been uh, responsible addressing these uh, issues. I don't think that the Human Rights Committee will um, really expand that um, uh, jurisprudence, but then we don't know what other judicial bodies uh, might uh, do. When you say uh, states uh, are, um, but then on, on the other hand, it could also help states to be to remain generous. Because as you say, states usually admit people. But what we have seen in some situations is admitting them is easy, returning them is difficult. 
um, because uh, once people are there, they will argue it's still not safe to go back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, for instance, uh, in the United States, temporary protection uh, for um, uh, victims of hurricanes, tropical storms in the late 1990s were still um, protected by temporary protection 15 years later. And it can't be like that. And if you can then take a decision like this and say that if you look at it from a human rights perspective, not a humanitarian one, then international law allows us to send you back because now it's no longer a life-threatening situation. So that's the other side of it. Uh, but it's a discussion that has to take place and I'm very happy that the Human Rights Committee triggered that uh, discussion. And uh, I think um, faced particularly with um, the uh, situation of um, low-lying uh, uh, small developing island states, it's a question we have to address, but we also have the time to really think it through and um, in that sense, um, yeah, you're all looking forward to those discussions. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one last question. If there is um, a question from our participants. No, there's a comment. Um, okay, um, a comment from uh, uh, Joy from the Philippines that is in the chat. A um, few weeks ago, the Philippines was ravaged by successive typhoons, which led to the evacuation of thousands of Filipinos into evacuation centers set up by their respective local governments. This was made much more difficult because evacuation centers, while they try, cannot as always uh, cannot always ensure physical distancing measures considering COVID-19 pandemic which means greater tendencies for transmission to take place. This was therefore a very interesting discussion which shows the gaps and things that governments should prioritize when it comes to disaster-induced displacement. So thank you, uh, Joy, for your comment. It's uh, also an interesting um, relation between uh, these efforts and the current situation that uh, certainly makes it more difficult. Last week we had uh, uh, Mr. Vittorino explaining as the interlinks between uh, um, COVID-19 and migration and how there are some positive aspects, but also some negative aspects. And certainly I mean, the pandemic um, affects uh, greatly um, all these um, efforts um, in, in relation to disaster uh, response. Um, I don't know if you want to make a last comment uh, in relation to this, Walter. Yes, uh, very short comment. I think uh, this is just one example of the challenge we are facing now um, when looking at international disaster law, namely to expand the scenarios. In the past, we have been, always been looking at um, sudden onset uh, weather or uh, geophysical disasters, hazards, climate change, but we really have to build into our uh, concepts, um, our policies, and then our guidelines and our laws, also at the dimension of epidemics and, and pandemics. And in that sense, enlarge uh, the scope of uh, international disaster law. Uh, because, um, yeah, these kind of situations, I mean, we see that this also in uh, settlement camps for internally displaced persons in Af Af Africa, doing work in uh, Somalia, Ethiopia refugee camps, etc. So it's not specific to, to this situation um, that was raised for the Philippines. It's a general uh, problem and again, challenges. It's a developing field, but that's why international disaster law is a very interesting and, and, uh, 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 and intellectually uh, challenging field of, of uh, international law as an emerging area where we need rules, uh, where we need clear concepts and ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Kalin. And I think with that, it's uh, time for us to wrap up. Uh, I thank uh, all the participants. We have uh, for... One more question. Oh. Emmanuel. The... I think he was. Uh...
uh, do you have a question, Emmanuel, or was it just a clap, a virtual clap to Professor <laughs> Kellen? It was just a virtual clap. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so this is much this appreciated. Is uh, what we can do now, which is virtual clapping. Uh, thank you so much um, for your wonderful lecture and for taking the time to be with us and, and share all your expertise and, and also draw the attention. This is something that we wanted with this module to this, as you said, emerging field of international law, that it's more and more uh, relevant and it, it brings together many different areas um, of, of international law and, and, and it um, deals with real problems uh, which will probably not decrease but increase um, in, in the future. So we were very grateful and on behalf of uh, the E Academy and uh, of Nilofer and myself, uh, we warmly thank you for um, your lecture, for being with us today, for replying to the questions of uh, our participants. Um, and um, for the participants, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for the continuation of this model. So have a good rest of the day. Take care and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Kaelin. Thank, Thank you, Patricia. Uh, for those of you who um, would like to share this lecture with friends, the recording will be publicly available on our Facebook and CIL YouTube channel. Do also, um, those of you watching from our Facebook stream, do also look out for the final three weeks of guest lectures. For more information on CIL events and activities, do follow us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Thank you and goodbye.